I don't know if you were here for the last story, but we just had an epic 9 update story about a mother-in-law. I'll put the link below. This is an entirely different story, but it's about a mother-in-law also, and this time it's a 3 series saga. This is part 1 that comes complete with 10 updates. When you think you've seen the craziest mother-in-law, oh, you've seen nothing yet. Guys, this one's crazy. I hope you're having an amazing day. Here's this wild mother-in-law named Magda. So, I'm 36 weeks pregnant with my first child, a baby boy. My mother-in-law, Magda, has fixated on us naming our child Patrick because I'm due in March. More than anything in the world, she wants us to name baby Patrick Liam to honor her family's Irish heritage. At the beginning of my third trimester, I could not take her constant badgering, so I blocked her number. I told Dear Husband all contact with her has to go through him. Dear Husband and I are both practicing Catholics. Both sides of our family have a tradition of naming children after saints. I have a saint name. Dear Husband and all of his siblings have saint names. My stepchildren have saint names, and Magda has a saint name. We're naming the baby Torabio Romo. Santa Torabio is a saint who was a parish priest in Mexico, in the town next to where my family's from. All the first sons in my family are given this name. It's a tradition I'm happy to continue. I'm at brother-in-law one's house for this Super Bowl party. My wide, pregnant butt is comfortably sitting in the recliner with my feet up. I'm feeling good. My feet are up. The kids are bringing me snacks and beverages, and Magda and brother-in-law's mother-in-law, Linda, are talking to me about babies and child rearing. Magda is on her best behavior in front of Linda. Linda's the treasurer of our church and also runs the women's Bible study group. So, she hasn't harped on naming the baby Patrick Liam. The conversation stays cheerful and lights up until Linda asks if we decided on a name. Magda's eyes open wide, and I coolly say, Oh, we're naming him after Santo Toribio. Before Linda can say anything, Magda starts ugly crying. Magda says Toribio is an unacceptable name. It's hard to pronounce, and his classmates will make fun of him for it. She thinks naming our children after the Patreon saint of immigrants is disgusting. Magda fell to the floor screaming that I've stolen her youngest son and am forcing him to turn his back on his Irish heritage. The only reason I'm with him was to get a green card and to escape my desperately poor life. She wishes dear husband's late wife was still here because she was nicer, aka she was a doormat, and would never dream of giving an innocent child such a disgusting name. My stepchildren deserve a better stepmother because I'm just a gold digger who's only concerned with money. Linda just looked at her in gaped mouth horror. I just got up and walked out of the house determined to not cry in front of Magda. I did not want to give her the satisfaction of knowing she hurt me. Magda is in denial that I'm not only a U.S. citizen, I'm U.S. born to U.S. born parents. She hates that my stepchildren adore me and like my parents more than her. I have some more stories about her because typing this out's exhausting. Thank you, Just No Mother-in-Law, for letting me vent. I have no idea what to do with her now. What's up, guys? Mr. Reddito here. I have nine complete updates for this insane roller coaster of a ride story. If you think you've seen the worst of Magda... You've seen nothing yet. I hope you're subscribed to the channel. If you don't know, there's three Mr. Reddito channels that upload daily videos. Please support me and subscribe to all three. You can find them in the description below with links directly to the channels. I hope you guys are having a great day. Let's see what Magda's up to. Here's update number two. My horrendous mother-in-law, Magda, had a racist meltdown directed at me. A Mexican-American at her oldest son's Super Bowl party. Luckily, my brother-in-law's mother-in-law, Linda, was there to witness the full splendor of Magda's hurtful words. Unfortunately, the rest of the family has been working hard to sweep everything under the rug and paint me as the bad guy. In my last post, I forgot to mention that I've known Linda since I was a kid. She was my teacher at school and I never had her, but my older sister and a bunch of my cousins were in her class. 
Magda has the story in her mind that I'm living in the U.S. with a stolen security number, have a desperately poor family, and I'm only with dear husband for money and U.S. citizenship. In her mind, my dedication to parenting my stepchildren is to brainwash them to love me, so dear husband can't leave me. As a graphic designer slash illustrator, I work half at the office, half at home. Mother-in-law thinks I work in a service job because of my, quote, untraditional hours. If it wasn't for me, her family would be happy and peaceful. You know, standard crazy mother-in-law stuff. Dear husband's wife, Jana, died in a car accident when the youngest was six months old. Shortly afterward, dear husband took a job across the country where he met me. That's how I met him. It's the annual company barbecue. Her family are a bunch of narcissistic a-holes, and Jana was totally the SG. When she died, her family just ghosted. And the entire time I've been with dear husband, Jana's family has never contacted the children. No phone calls, no visits, no cards, nothing. That's fine with me because my family was overjoyed to add dear husband and the kids to the family. The kids' school pictures are on my parents' living room wall, right along with all the other grandchildren. I've been with dear husband since the kids were 2, 4, and 6. They're now youngest, 12, middle, 14, and oldest, 16. And I'm pregnant with my first baby due in three weeks. Magda loathes with every fiber of her being that my family loves the kids so much. It fills her with jealous rage that they prefer going to my parents' tiny house in the hood rather than her sterile tracked mansion in a bland subdivision. It gets under her skin that I taught the children to speak Spanish and they go to bilingual school. When she comes over to the house and the Spanish language TV or radio's on, she turns it off and makes an exaggerated sigh of relief. Magda lost her mind when MD plucked her eyebrows thin with a high arc, copied from the photos of me in high school from the 90s. MD is rocking the East LA style like her cousins. Brown lipstick, huge hoop earrings, black Chuck Taylors, big hair, I love it. This wasn't a day-to-day -day problem before we moved back to Southern California. Before, we lived across the country in Florida. We've been back about two years now and I'm ducking done. The day after the party, Otis' son went to my sister's house to hang out with his cousins. He told them what happened and they got all riled up. The Latino mechanism. Meanwhile, Magda had been text bombing older son, pleading with him not to be upset. Magda can't be herself in talking crap about me, enraging older son further. She offered to give older son's father-in-law's old Lexus that he did not sell when he bought his new car. Older son told her to go duck herself. Dear husband and I have been arguing throughout this pregnancy because Magda would not give me any space. As soon as we announced I was pregnant, she texted me multiple times a day, asking for updates. Magda was already annoyed that I refused to let her have a co-parenting relationship with the kids when she moved back to Southern California. I suspected that's why dear husband moved across the country when Jana died, she wanted to go to all of my prenatal appointments and ultrasounds like she did for all of her grandchildren. Magda was also displeased that I wasn't going to let her pick out the baby's name like she did for all of her other grandchildren. I finally blocked her number and told DH that all communication from her had to go through him. Magda wants the baby's name to be Patrick Liam, as he's due in March. We're having to name the baby Toribio Romo because it has a significant sentimental meaning in my family. Dear husband and I had an argument about maybe using the middle name of Liam. I refuse because Magda will end up calling him Liam and the rest of dear husband's side will follow suit. Magda called dear husband at work and cried about only son telling her to duck herself. Dear husband let Magda cry on the phone for about 30 minutes, upset at the way we let the children disrespect their elders. None of this would happen if I just followed the family tradition of Magda being the third spouse in her children's marriage. My wordings. Older son already riled up from his cousins, overheard that argument on Tuesday, and exploded the next night on Wednesday. Magda will not stop text bombing all the children. Older son and dear husband start arguing in the backyard. 
Older son tells dear husband he's a failure as a man, a father, and a husband for allowing Magda to act like this. I stayed out of it because I found myself agreeing with older son way too much. Older son loves my parents more because they love him as a person. Magda just treats him as a lifestyle accessory. As soon as he's 18, he'll never speak to her again because she's just blood-related. By my side, loves him like family. Should always love someone. Older son also said that if dear husband and I got divorced, him and his siblings would want to live with me because he'll just crawl up Magda's booty, begging her to love him. He said that he wishes that we never move back to Southern California. He liked it better when Magda only visits once a year and stayed in a hotel. Dear husband ended the argument by telling older son to go to his room. When I heard older son's bedroom door slam and dear husband stomping into the back room to watch TV, I took MD, aka middle daughter, and younger son to get burgers. At an in and out they filled me in on Magda's constant texting. They have not responded back because they're afraid of causing more drama. My heart's breaking. I felt guilty for standing my ground because it's hurting the kids with the tension. Then they start talking about all the times Magda has been mean to me and I was nice back. I had to reassure them that dear husband and I aren't talking about divorce because Magda told them dear husband and I are going to break up a family and we'll abandon them like Jana's family did. She wants to reconcile because soon she'll be the only grandmother they have. She has a forgiving heart and she still loves them. I try to play it cool even though I'm seeing red. I'm an adult with kids, a successful corporate career, and a late model minivan. But I'm still from the barrio. The East LA Chola in me wants to fill a sock full of pennies and use it to beat her surgically enhanced face in. I purposely keep the conversation in English at the in and out so I can make sure I choose my words more carefully. It's getting late, so we go home. The kids go to their bedrooms. Dear husband tries to get me to sympathize with him over this argument of him and older son. I'm most definitely not sympathetic. I tell him that the way younger kid told me, oldest son most definitely did not mention that part to dear husband, and dear husband gets angry again. I told him I'm not interested in anything he has to say because he hasn't handled his mother. I told him he needs to sleep in the TV room. I would go, but seeing pregnant with his son requires me to have a bed with better lumbar support. Dear husband stomps out of the room and slams the door. Older son texts me to tell me he's sorry for causing the fight between me and dear husband. Me and dear husband don't speak from Thursday yesterday morning. Even though he's angry with his mom, he's also mad at me for not backing him up during the fight with older son. Middle daughter went through her clothes and gave everything that Magda gave to her to Goodwill. Younger son is spending extra time practicing the piano. I know he's upset because he's only playing songs in minor key. So, we go to Sunday Mass and Magda isn't there. I don't take my cell phone and I don't allow the kids to take their phones to church either. After I caught middle daughter scrolling through Instagram during a Mass a few months back... When I get home, I saw a voicemail from father-in-law. I listened to it, and father-in-law went on for three minutes about how I, yeah, I, need to resolve this conflict with Magda because it's my fault, and Magda feels uncomfortable at church because I made her out to be a monster to the other parish and ears. Traditions are important in their family, and I was inconsiderate for even discussing the choice of names with her. He also said that they still love me even though there are many huge cultural differences between us. Also, is older son sure he doesn't want his old Alexis? It was dear husband's turn to help clean the chapel after service. When he got home from church, I had him listen to the voicemail. Afterwards, he apologized for me and asked me to go to couples counseling. Linda told our priest about what Magda said at the Super Bowl party. Instead of cleaning the chapel after Mass, the priest and dear husband had a long talk. Older son had disowned Magda and father-in-law. He wrote them a no-contact letter and blocked their numbers from his phone, blocked them on Facebook, and set his email to automatically delete emails from them. 
I'm sad it's come to this, but impressed that only son has the fortitude at year 16 to cut toxic people out of his life. The kids aren't just stepchildren to me. They're my everything. I've made many personal and professional sacrifices to make sure they have the best childhood possible. I'm getting a little teary-eyed right now because I hate that Magda has spewed out such disgusting, vile bullcrap trying to make them hate me. It hurts me deeply that she can't just be happy with her son and who her son's marrying a good woman who loves his children unconditionally. There we go. I'm sure after my baby boy is born, there'll be a fresh uptick in Magda's shenanigans. Dear husband has not gone non-contact with her yet, so I know the fighting will continue. I'm grateful that my brother's wife is coming to stay with us for six weeks after the baby's born. I need someone else to be there so I don't cave to Magda in my vulnerable postpartum time. Last night, I dreamt that I cut Magda's tongue out with a kitchen knife, and I ate it in tacos a la lunga. I woke up a little sad that it did not actually happen. Update number two. When Magda convinced her granddaughter she was obese. My middle kid is doing the purge. She's getting rid of everything that Magda's given her. The bag of stuff in the hall today has reminded me of why I don't allow her unsupervised time with the kids. When we moved to Southern California from Florida, Magda assumed that things would go like they did with her other grandchildren. Dear husband is the bumper baby, eight years apart from his older brother. The rest of his nieces and nephews are adults who have all moved away. Magda was so excited to spend their time with her younger grandchildren. She offered to take them to school in the morning, four days a week, and drive middle daughter to her soccer practice, and take her home after the three days a week. It was too good to be true. She was never late, but cut it way too close for my liking in the mornings. She would insist on picking up middle daughter in the afternoon in her tiny roadster, the trunk too small to fit her huge duffel bag, so she would have to put it in her lap, blocking her from seeing out of the car. This really made me mad because she had no problem picking them up in the mornings with her S500 sedan. Right at the end of the first school year in Cali, middle daughter started dramatically restricting her food intake. She thought she was clever by taking small portions and chewing very slowly. She started working out harder, knocking out another hour on the stationary bike after practice. She was so cranky all the time. I was wondering what her friends were pushing her into, and she admittedly denied it. We were on week three of five of Dear Husband being in South America on a business trip. Middle daughter comes inside looking like she just finished crying. Magda follows her looking like the cat who ate the canary. I'm busy getting dinner together while making sure younger son's doing his homework at the kitchen table. Magda comes over to my stove and toots toots what I'm making, telling me middle daughter might be depressed in high school if she stayed stocky. Just because I'm Mexican doesn't mean the kid should eat beans fried in lard daily. She understands that food's cheap in the U.S., but I should not fall in the trap of eating rich food every day because it's available. So I asked her to leave. Her ears just tear up and she fake apologizes. She just wants to make sure her grandchildren are happy and healthy. If cooking is too much of a burden, she should be more than happy to pay for a service to deliver our meals. Daily, if we need. Older son and younger son got really excited. I was tired from working full-time and having the kids on my own. The idea of daily meal services while dear husband was gone didn't sound so bad. Joke's on me. Because that food was terrible and Magda made sure to tell everybody how lazy I am when dear husband's gone. So, hearing my frustration with middle daughter, my brother offers to take her with him when he visits his in-laws in Mexico. My sister-in-law's families are hardcore soccer fan, and she has quite a few nieces middle daughter's age. She was gone for three days when my brother calls me. Middle daughter has been food restricting over working, and because... Magda is the one who told her that she needs to have muscle definition and a flat stomach to be successful in Southern California. Middle daughter is obese, and if she doesn't get it together, she'll be a social pariah. 
She also offered to pay for the breast implants as a high school graduation gift, on the condition she gets and stays fit. I told dear husband and he called Magda. She at first denied saying those things before eventually admitting to it. She's only looking out for middle daughter's best interests because she'll be as large as a dumpster if they keep eating my cooking. Besides, we should have been proud of middle daughter's dedication. She works hard and looks fantastic. She non-apologized and dear husband ate it up. After we got off the phone, he seemed proud of how he handled the situation. Middle daughter did not look fantastic. She was thin, pale, irritable, and she was losing a lot of hair. We fought daily over trivial stuff, and my funny and easygoing girl became a nightmare. I was exhausted, so I just let it slide. When middle daughter came back, she gained a little weight and had her color back. We went out clothes shopping for school when middle daughter said she did not want to play soccer anymore. I had to really pry it out of her that she wanted to quit, so Magda doesn't drive her to practice anymore. The entire time in the car, she pinned to her seat from the back, and Magda's interrogating her about what she ate and how she's working out. Some of Magda's friends volunteer with the club. Magda wanted to make absolutely sure that middle daughter made her look the world's best grandparent. I wanted dear husband to tell her that her chauffeur service was no longer needed. He tried to just mess around with it, angering Magda, and they had a huge fight, ending with Magda no longer wanting to take the children to school. Awesome. I felt so good a few days later when Magda asked for the school schedule, I told her not to worry about it. Again, she made sure to tell everyone how I'm actively alienating her grandchildren from her. I never told anyone that she wasn't allowed to have unsupervised time with the kids. I just maneuvered it so it did not happen. I still feel guilty about letting middle daughter's brief brush with a compulsive over-exercising happen. Post update number three, Magda threw a lawn tantrum. Today, I was taking a pregnancy-induced coma nap in the living room when I woke up to my nephew, Louis. He's our landscaper, arguing with someone in the front yard. I peek out the front window, and he's arguing with two men, in front of a truck from a very expensive furniture store near my a-hole mother-in-law Magda's house. They stop arguing when I open the front door. Louis instantly apologizes for waking me up from my nap. He explains that this store is trying to deliver a bunch of furniture, a new piano, and it's all paid for. When he saw Magda's name on the receipt, he knew I would not want it. The delivery guys just could not understand how I could refuse a complete nursery set made of teak and a brand new Yamaha piano. I ended up calling the store, telling the manager if they did not leave, I was going to call the cops. Refund Magda's money or don't. I don't give a crap. This furniture was not coming off the truck into my home. So, the delivery guys and Magda's furniture leave and Lewis goes back to working on the flower beds. Huh. I knew it wasn't over. When I hung up with the manager of the store, I knew Magda was going to be at my house in 55 minutes. 25 minutes to get the phone call and summon her flying monkeys. 30 minutes to drive to my house with said flying monkeys. Right on schedule, Magda, sister-in-law too, and her daughter-in-law came roaring up our street in Magda's car. Magda's in front seat was sister-in-law's daughter-in-law driving, her mascara streaking down her face and raging me further. Her streaked-up makeup was for show, her eyes weren't puffy, and her favorite mascara's waterproof. Before she could bang on my door, I threw it open and told him to leave. She stops in the middle of the walk and just chastises me for refusing to be part of the family. Why did I insist of having to do things different and have such blatant disregard for the last name family traditions? She just wants to love me and she loves her grandson. With him still being born in the US, I'll have an easier path to citizenship. She's sorry for threatening to get me deported. She wants to resolve our conflicts before the baby's born. And then, bam, my nephew hits her with a garden hose. He makes sure to absolutely soak her. He's yelling at her to leave before he calls the cops and he follows her to the car, hose on full blast. 
Quite a bit of water gets into her stupid fancy car before she can get in and close the door. They take off quickly before they're even to the freeway. Magda calls me using granddaughter-in-law's cell phone. She's screaming into the phone and she told me that she still loves me and I need to get over it. Dear husband and I have been married for long enough for me to know that she's the head of the family. I need to know my place. I told her that she'll never meet her grandson. She's not allowed to come to the hospital. She is not invited to his christening. We will never come to holidays in her home. Dear husband's free to have whatever relationship he wants with her. But now, the two older children, me, and the still fetus in my stomach don't have a relationship. The youngest can decide, but trying to buy his affection with a new piano is offensive. I'll not be encouraging him to spend time with her. I hang up. Dear husband and the kids have said nothing about her when they get home. I don't know what's going to happen now. There, Magda Elephants is in the room and even saying her name out loud enrages me. Next update, four days later, Magda visits her adult grandchildren. Last time on My Mother-in-Law's a Psycho A-Hole, she tried to buy my youngest son a new piano and my unborn baby a suite of unnecessarily expensive nursery furniture. I refused delivery and she came over to yell. My nephew turned on the garden hose and she wouldn't leave. He got a lot of water inside of her car, but she left. I suspect my father-in-law did not know that she just dropped that kind of money, which he did not. This brings us to yesterday. My brother-in-law too, husband and father-in-law, to the flying monkeys Magda brought her with to yell at me, leaves a panic test message for dear husband to call him ASAP. Dear husband's still mad that brother-in-law too's wife and daughter-in-law joined Magda to try to bully me into submitting to her will. He doesn't return the text or call. After getting flurry of panic texts from all of his brothers and cousins, dear husband finally calls father-in-law. American Express called father-in-law. The furniture store refused to refund Magda after I refused delivery. She tried to get it charged back, claiming fraud, and the furniture store called the house number instead of Magda's cell phone. Father-in-law picks up the phone, and the owner told father-in-law he can go duck himself. They're banned from the store because of Magda's behavior. Okay, cue the blowout fight between them. Magda leaves in a dramatic fashion. She doesn't come or call Friday night, and by Saturday afternoon, he logs into the mobile bank to see Magda made a sizable cash withdrawal in a branch near an out-of-way airport. She took a plane somewhere, but father-in-law can't tell where, and United put him on hold for 45 minutes before he gave up. So, dear husband recounts this to me while I'm playing video games with younger son, and I'm pretty much ignoring it because this is just more escalation of her bullcrap. It wasn't until he said this. Let it slip that mom redesigned her medication resume. When I actually paid attention. Awesome. An improperly medicated psycho running around with major financial strengths. Huh. Awesome. Yesterday morning, brother-in-law 3's daughter Tammy, Magda's number one scapegoat, calls her parents upset because Magda showed up at her door disheveled and wearing sweatpants, crying hysterically about needing to reunite her family. Magda lives in Southern California, Tammy, Virginia, and not close to a major airport. Magda's in Tammy's house, terrifying her great-grandchildren that she's never met before, just carrying on. Honestly, I can't believe Tammy let her in considering they've been on a no contact for at least five years. Tammy agrees to let Magda stay there until father-in-law gets there. He'll book the next flight out and Magda flips out when she hears his plan and leaves. Tammy tells father-in-law she doesn't give enough of a duck to chase after her. Magda does the same to brother-in-law 2's daughter, Bambi, who lives in New Jersey. Granddaughter comes from a work to Magda crying again hysterically about wanting to reunite the family. The building manager let her in the apartment, believe it or not. Bambi and Magda have been estranged for a long time. Bambi was at least expecting something because Tammy texted all of her cousins warning them. She kept it cool, gave Magda a crapload of special pills and a glass of wine. 
She was passed out long enough to be collected by father-in-law. So, this isn't the first time Magda's gone off her medicine, had a ragey meltdown at someone else that she did not like in the first place, and then goes on spending sprees. This is the third time she's done it. The first two times were when we were living in Florida, so the family decided to just not tell dear husband. This sounds so ducking ridiculous, I know. When I vented about this to my mom, she just threw up her hands. She feels sorry for my white people problems. Yes, this is the total no contact time. I told dear husband and father-in-law also need to be cut off. He's enabled this behavior for far too long. I'm thinking also about changing hospitals to have the baby. I'm just paranoid that dear husband's family is not going to properly deal with Magda. Just bring her back to Southern California. I'm so mad at her mental health crisis. I'd feel less guilty if she was just her regular a-hole self. Next post, four days later, Magda's Intervention. After Magda's epic freakout and impromptu visit to the East Coast to harass and stalk her no-contact granddaughters, she's returned to Southern California. All total, she's visited three of her five granddaughters, Tammy, Bambi, and Renee. All have been no-contact with her for at least five years. When father-in-law collected Magda from Bambi's, she escaped the hotel and drove from South New Jersey to upstate New York to Renee's house. Renee especially hates Magda because Magda stopped paying her college tuition when she would not break up with her Jewish boyfriend, now husband. She converted, they got married, she finished college and moved upstate. Their wedding was the best family event with dear husband's family I'd ever gone to. Because his parents weren't there, this is where I got hip to raise Kugel. Google his stuff and get into it. Magda shows up at Renee's house, pounding on the door, screaming about family unity. Renee's mother-in-law calls the cops, and Magda gets arrested. Father-in-law finally catches up with her, and they take the next flight back to L.A. from Buffalo. Brother-in-law 1 puts together an intervention at his house. His marriage is on the rocks right now because this is not Magda's first mental health meltdown that he's had to deal with. His mother-in-law, Linda, witnessed Magda's racist freakout at me at their Super Bowl party. Linda has known my family for a long time. She taught at the school we went to. Linda has been talking in her daughter's ear about how she should divorce brother-in-law one. He is desperate to give his mom reined in. Dear husband refused to go to the intervention. His brothers begged him and he completely refused. He says Magda is dead to him and dead people can't have interventions. I'm proud of him for that. When they came back on Wednesday night, Bambi calls me to let me know that they're going to have an intervention. Father-in-law and dear husband's brother thinks the girls are coming for support. Renee and Tammy's brother, who's in the Navy on a boat somewhere, will be Skyping in. Well, they had the meeting this morning. Bambi is a mastermind. She had father-in-law. Dear husband's brother, the GC grandson, and his wife say supportive, loving things about how they want her to get help for her mental issues and RX addiction. When it was the girls' turn to talk, each of them gave Magda CD letters and said a variation of, I'll come to your funeral to make sure you're dead. Father-in-law was mad because he paid for airfare, rental cars, and hotels for everyone. An argument ensued about how ungrateful everyone is. Then, father-in-law scolded his sons for raising such jerks for daughters. Magda had another tantrum, screaming about how nobody loves her and she's made so many sacrifices for her family. She should just get rid of herself. Blah, blah, blah. Ultimately, Magda agreed to do the 90-day rehab program. The website makes it look way more like a spa than a rehab. I'm sure she'll love the daily individual and group therapy sessions, massages, and horseback riding on the beach. On the plus side, my baby showers tomorrow and dear husband's nieces are in town, so they get to come. Our lawyer friend sent a sternly worded letter with Magda's photos to the hospital I'm having the baby at. My OB got me in touch with the hospital's risk management department. I'm registered privately with a flag on my chart to not only admit dear husband and my older brother's wife, who is like my second mom, 
My stepkids are staying with my parents while I'm in the hospital. I feel a lot better, a whole lot better now that I know Magda is being fawned over in rehab. Next update, 15 days later. Thankfully, I'm on baby high still, so I'm not as upset as it could be. I gave birth to a beautiful baby boy yesterday, 31716, just after midnight. I had an easy short labor with a perfectly healthy baby. I was in the hospital for about 12 hours. This was a nice easy end to an emotionally difficult pregnancy. I'm glad after everything my nutso mother-in-law put me through, at least birthing my baby boy was a breeze. My brother-in-law's mother-in-law, Linda, just called me asking why Magda announced the birth of my baby on Facebook with photos and sent me screenshots. My youngest big kid texted those pictures to her along with the vitals. Magda wrote a pitiful paragraph about how she's sad and that her grandson's birth is tainted by the animosity from me. It's like it never ends. I was foolish to think she would actually stay in rehab through the birth of her grandbaby. I'm so thankful for my sister-in-law, my oldest bro's wife, and my second mom being here, so at least I know Magda won't get into my home. But duck, man, I don't know what to do with the boy. I can't even look at him right now because I feel so violated. I hate Magda because she's the master manipulator and knows exactly how to get under the kid's skin. On the other hand, he was told directly by me and his father that he is not to communicate with her. I was beating him with a sock full of pennies would make me feel better and remedy the situation. Next update, one month later. My mother-in-law's a psycho a-hole and a little jerk, if you can fill that in. It's been quiet after the Facebook fiasco. My sister-in-law, Sylvia, is taking care of me, cooking, cleaning, handling the big kids. I've been lounging around the house with the baby, getting breastfeeding. Two weeks after the baby was born, dear husband had to go to Asia for a work thing. This has been planned for the last two years. It was expected and unavoidable. April 20th. Well, that's a hard day for me. I was in a pretty bad car accident while pregnant with my boyfriend, Victor. He died and I lost the baby. Holding baby Mo, the exact copy of Dear Husband, is a little bittersweet. Victor was my first everything. We were about to get married. I was absolutely devastating, and I still managed to graduate college with a double major in good grades. In our living room, Dear Husband and I have a little shrine for our departed loved ones. The first time Magda saw the shrine, she got really weird for the rest of her trip to visit us. She's always wanted to just come visit us in April under the guise of Easter and I let her. Without fail, she would say something snarky when I would be glum this time of year. How could I be sad when I had this beautiful family? Why aren't I happy with the big kids? During the month of April, I light candles and say a prayer for Victor and my lost daughter. One year, I caught Magda blowing out the candles. I don't know why I didn't call her out, I just relit them. Last year, she told me it's inappropriate to light candles for him because we're not married, and it was a long time ago. But she also has no problem lighting candles for dear husband's departed wife. Today, Magda sends me a large, angel-themed flower arrangement. I was going to post a picture, but my oldest stepson might see this here and ask me not to. It's very large, like something you would see in a funeral. I was by myself. Sylvia took the big kids to school and was running errands. The attention to detail is stunning, and Magda knows exactly where to go and make it hurt. I didn't let the delivery guy bring it inside. After he left, I put Mo in the swing, then ugly cried next to the beautiful flowers. I grieve for the family I wish dear husband could have had. Since Magda's meltdown during the Super Bowl, there's a sadness in his eyes when we're with my side of the family. He grew up cared for by a yearly changing nanny and housekeeper. It hurts him to know that he was only a lifestyle accessory. I love dear husband, but sometimes I miss Victor so much it hurts. I still hurt for my oldest lost daughter. I was with him for six years, you know. 
Our families are still close friends, and that life was stolen from me by the drunk asshole who crashed into us and did not leave without a scratch. When I was done crying at the flowers, a wave of dark, cold, aching sadness hit me. This was different from the bitter tears of exhausted frustration. Seeing those flowers made me remember a thousand memories of Victor all at once. Then I think about crying so hard in my hospital bed, with nothing but stitches. I cuddle my tiny baby, thankfully he's healthy and alive. I hate her so much. I've always been kind, polite, and compromising with her. She used it against me. I put up with Magda's bullcrap for so long when I put my foot down. She tries to alienate my youngest big kid from me and taunts me about my departed partner and lost daughter. I try not to really think about it, but I imagine myself dancing in a red dress over her grave. Oh boy, I could really use a blunt the size of my infant's arm. But I'm breastfeeding. The idea of pump and dump makes me feel really sad I bring myself to do it. I ducking hate 420 so much, OMG, I wish the stoner holiday wasn't tainted by this. Final update of part one. So yeah, bad news, or rather sad news. Father-in-law died on Monday. He had a heart attack in the shower, likely dead before he hit the floor. My sister-in-law, Linda, called me to inform me of the news. The call was mostly a warning of the memorial service and funeral plans Magda had. Magda's holding court in her house, enjoying being the grieving widow while her daughter-in-laws flutter around the house entertaining guests. Father-in-law was a very successful businessman in his industry. Many people in the industry will be there, networking their butts off. Getting invited to his memorial service is a major professional coup. Magda is very aware of this and let me tell ya, she's loving it. I checked my Magda folder and sure enough was the summons to the memorial service and funeral with instructions on appropriate dress. It's ducking laughable and I'm leaning towards not going at all. Dear husband's in Asia for another six weeks. A little bit of a tidbit. The boys, including the baby, are to wear black suits, white shirts, black ties. The older boys are to tie their ties in a half Windsor knot. Father-in-law's favorite. It is acceptable to the baby to have a clip-on tie. Daughter and I have to wear black dresses. The neckline should be high, shoulders and elbows covered, of course. The hem of our dresses should be no shorter than one inch above our knees. No bare legs and no flat shoes. Our hair and makeup will need to be professionally done. It'll go to her regular salon and they'll bill her for the services. Dear husband needs to come back from Asia for the funeral. He won't answer her phone call, so it's up to me to convince him. He needs to be here for this difficult time for the family. If he absolutely cannot leave, Skyping will marginally be acceptable. And finally, there will be professional photographers documenting the memorial service, funeral mass, and burial. It is vitally important we are photo ready at all times. Some of these photos will be published in the major trade publications of father-in-law's industry. Y'all, I wish I had more eyes to roll. From what my sister-in-law told me, Magda's meltdown at me really did father-in-law in. After the intervention, he really started going downhill. Dear husband and I have not talked about his father dying. I figured when he's ready to talk to me about it, he'll talk. Right now, he's on a career-defining business trip. The last thing I want to talk to him about when he has a Skype date is his father's death. When I told the older kids that father-in-law died, my middle kid rolled her eyes and said, Why couldn't the Lord just take her instead? They've decided that they won't go. Wise women of just no mother-in-law, what should I do? Tell me about your experiences, I love you so much, and one final small update to add before the end of part one. I had a long conversation with dear husband last night. I made him talk about the logistics of his father's death. He's not coming home from Asia. Quote, I'm missing my son's first months of life for this project. I can easily miss father-in-law's funeral. If he comes back early, he'll have to go back. He also forwarded me several emails Magda sent him badmouthing me. 
Dear husband's aunt Carol, father-in-law's younger sister, wants me to sit down at the mass and burial with her. Her husband passed away a few years ago and her kids weren't able to fly from Florida for the funeral. We're very close and I'm honored that she wants me there. Magda and Carol had a major falling out in the 90s. Carol's the bigger person, so Magda steers clear. Carol assures me that at no point will Magda come near any of us. Father-in-law's brother's children and grandchildren are attending. They'll make sure we're surrounded. I'm not attending the public service. I have a couple of dark-colored pantsuits I can get in with some spanks and a prayer. I'm not at all catapulting to Magda's dress code. Yeah, right. My attire at these events will lean heavily towards funeral attire. My youngest big kid is taking this better than I expected. He's still without a computer and phone privileges after sending Magda photos of the baby. He's working in my uncle's recording studio after school to keep him busy. It's really improving his musical abilities. The reading of father-in-law's wills today at 12. I'm on high alert for Magda to come over afterwards crying about her family and wanting to see the baby. Lewis is working on my yard this afternoon and Magda could get water hosed again. Make sure you subscribe to the channel because part two of this story, yeah, that's right, this is a three-part saga, is coming out tomorrow. So this story was a lot to unpack. The craziest part to me, though, it just showed Magda's true character. When father-in-law passed away and she was so happy at the funeral, just trying to get as much attention as she possibly can. Surprisingly to me, there were some comments in this that were supporting Magda. I don't know, guys. What do you think? Who was the worst in this story? My opinion, it was Magda. But drop your thoughts down below. This is part one, so we're going to see plenty more Magna coming up tomorrow. I still have part two and part three for you. I couldn't fit in in one video because it's just too long and what she does next might blow your mind. So make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss part two that's coming out tomorrow. And in part two, I'll always leave the description and link for part one. Thank you so much for tuning in to this crazy mother-in-law saga. And Mr. Redito will see you tomorrow. Have a wonderful day.